Hello, everyone. Also from my um, side, and welcome to this first session of the of the day, which is my pleasure to chair. I'm Massimo Ferrari Minesso. I have uh, here uh, uh, the speakers today: uh, Janet uh, uh, Young from Bank of Canada, uh, Maria Rosa uh, Breru, uh, Benjamin Hemingway, and Tim from the uh, University of Liverpool, who is uh, joining us uh, shortly on the stage. Um, we have uh, uh, two great papers in this session about the CBDCs and monetary policy transmission. The first by uh, Janet on the pass-through of CBDCs to monetary policy, and the second by Benjamin on the impact of uh, central bank digital currencies on deposits and the intermark market. Uh, without taking more time from my speakers, uh, I give the floor to uh, Janet who will uh, uh, present her paper, Monetary Policy Pass-Through with Central Bank Digital Currencies. Thank you. So, it's going to be very low. Okay, good. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Okay, so, uh, so I'm Janet, and I uh, uh, thank the organizers for bringing us here for, for this couple of days, and I look forward to the discussion on CBDC, which I've been working on for quite a few years now. Uh, so um, this paper is about uh, uh, how CBDC is going to affect monetary policy transmission, and it's a joint paper with my former colleague, Yu Zhu, uh, who is uh, on leave right now at Renmin University. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, a, a very brief intro. Uh, I guess we don't have to motivate why we're doing research on CBDC. Uh, so yeah, many, many, many of the central banks are are researching on this, right? So uh, ECB has been a little bit far, a little bit far ahead, I guess, in terms of whether to whether to do uh, the, the CBDC, or whether to issue CBDC or not. Um, but even other central banks, even if they are not at this stage yet, they, they, they are very active in, in research on, on this topic. Okay, so, um, so CBDC, uh, the, the remuneration, uh, as our keynote just ha had talked about, uh, although it's not an active sort of monetary policy consideration, but it's for sure a, a very important uh, issue, right? Maybe because it's so important, so that's why we have been very careful with it. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do today is to um, see how sort of CBDC is going to affect the um, the um, monetary policy pass through. In particular, I'm going to talk about how a CBDC is going to affect the uh, pass through of traditional monetary policy instruments like uh, the interest rate on reserves. Okay, and and. Um, I think I will be focusing on, on that part at first, and if I have a little bit of time, I will also talk a little bit about how the pass-through of uh, CBDC, uh, the interest on CBDC itself. Um, but as I guess, yeah, it's, a key, it's probably not the most important question, but I think uh, we we need to know that, I think, beforehand, and how uh, the interest on reserve is going to affect the pass-through of CBDC itself as well. Okay. So the um, I mean the literature. I think I left one paper out there. I just realized that uh, last night, but I don't I don't want to bother Nina to to, to update the slide. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so we have a few papers on on the interaction between CBDC and the monetary policy transmission. So there there are a bunch of other papers, and which are going to see like the micro uh, microeconomic consequences. So these ones are the like more related literature. Okay. And the one I left out is uh, the paper by Rod Garrett and his co-authors. Um, so. We'll add that for sure. Um, okay, so uh, the main takeaway is that uh, it's a kind of a serious consideration in the sense that, uh, so at least from our funding, is that uh, we find that the CBDC and, and the traditional monetary policy instruments are going to be in each, in each other's way. They tend to be in each, each other's way. So if we have a CBDC in the world, okay, we need to have some actual considerations about monetary policy implementation. Um, and, and also the, um, so the mechanisms, how, how they interact with each other, it depends on the um, mark structure of the banking sector, especially the, uh, on the uh, deposit market. And that's sort of a, uh, also intuitive because we know the banking system plays a very important role in the, in the, in the, in the process of a monetary policy transmission. Okay. Um, and because of that, the so policy uh, in, uh, coordination is required to achieve some policy goals. Okay. okay the environment, uh, sort of, Pretty brief. Uh, so this is based on uh, our 
old paper, um, maybe not too old, I guess. So everything about CBDC is not too old. Uh, so, uh, so we uh, so we have a uh, so the this even horizon. We have um, basically uh, the uh, so every period has like two sub markets and a centralized market and decentralized market, and I will explain that a little bit more later. And we have four types of private agents, uh, and we have uh, buyers and sellers who are infinitely lived, and we have entrepreneurs and, and the bankers. They live for two periods. Basically, they're born in the centralized market, and then they go through CM, DM, and then they're going to die in the next uh, in next CM. Okay, so the DM uh, is where the payments are 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 are. Are, are going okay so so we have buyers who want to consume but they don't produce and I have producers who, who are the reverse okay they can produce but they don't consume and there are some frictions in the economy such that we need a means of payment okay for means and payment we have three choices we have cash and um, bank deposits as we will have now and a CBDC if we have have that, that, that would be another um, alternative okay the centralized market um, it's centralized. There's no frictions there. Uh, I mean, technically, you do not need a means of payment there. Um, for, for for us, it's kind of a kind of like a technical uh, reason why we have that because it makes the model very tractable. Okay, so there everybody can can trade in the world radio market. Market. Uh, so the good is X, and buyers and sellers they have a linear. Uh, they can uh, they have a linear utility or this utility from per producing so you can consume or you can you can uh, you can produce if it's produce it's going to be negative uh, um, negative number negative utility and if you, if you consume you're going to be a positive utility okay and then we have uh, also the young young entrepreneurs right they are born and they have a productive technology um, but they cannot produce when they're young so what they need is they need to uh, borrow some money okay, from the economy from uh, and it's, as I said, it's going from, from the bank <laughs> so they're going to borrow the money and they're going to uh, do the production and that production is going to materialize in the next cm okay um, and they only consume when they are when they're old okay uh, for the uh, central bank, so uh, we also have the bankers. I'm going to have the next slide for for that because the, the, the banks are the most important probably players in the in the economy. Uh, for the uh, for policy, um, we have it kind of a simple. Uh, so we have the central central banks, and we have the fiscal authority as well. For central banks, uh, they issue reserves and a CBDC. So these are two forms of central bank liabilities. Okay, and they choose the growth rate. Uh, of these two liabilities, uh, of these two liabilities, at the same time they also set the interest. Okay, so I have the interest on in reserves. I also have interest on CBDC. Okay, um, and then for the fiscal side, it's sort of very straightforward, uh, not very complicated at all, not very sophisticated at all. So basically, they uh, they uh, uh, just do a lump sum transfer, transfer or tax, basically to accommodate the monetary policy. Okay, so the banks. So they are very important um, players. Uh, so they um, so they are also uh, sort of live for two periods. Uh, so uh, when they they also uh, also consume when they're when they're old, but they cannot produce eggs. So what they do is um, they can they can provide some intermediation uh, for the economy. So so. Um, and they also uh, provide payment services because bank deposits can be used for payments as well. Okay, so now take a look at their sort of balance sheet. Right, so we have the assets and liabilities. And liabilities, the, the bank issues bank deposits. Okay, and the deposits are going to be used by households for payments. On the assets side, okay, uh, we are going to have uh, loans. So that's that will be issued to entrepreneurs to finance their projects. Okay. And um, of course, the bank can also hold some central bank liabilities as as a form of uh, investment. Okay, so it can be reserves. Uh, it can also be CBDC. So if we have CBDC, CBDC, we we, we assume that the bank can also hold a CBDC. Okay, um, on our balance sheet. Uh, so as a form of of assets. Okay. And so the households, uh, they're going to generate the demand for deposits. So basically, that's going to basically that's going to be the uh, the right hand side, and the entrepreneurs they're going to generate demand for 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 loans. So, so the little eyes, they are the uh, they are the uh, sort of deposit rate. So ID is deposit rate, and IL that's the loan rate. Okay, D for deposit, L for 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 loans. Okay. Um, 
And there's a reserve requirement, okay? Uh, this can be uh, fulfilled with either reserves or CBDC. So that's, that's our assumption. The paper had, we got a previous version and uh, uh, we assume that uh, banks cannot use uh, CBDC for reserves, but uh, uh, at the conference, I think Cyril, Cyril is in the audience, I think online. <laughs> so he suggested that probably it's more reasonable to, to make the other assumptions. So we changed that since, since August. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, so uh, I will first uh, talk about okay, how CBDC affects the pass-through of interest on reserves. And uh, for the pass-through, we'll be focusing a little bit narrowly focused. We'll be focusing on these sort of de just the deposit and loans, the, the rates, and also the quantities. Okay, um, and, and then, um, so as I said, the market structure could be important. So I will first talk about the uh, competitive deposit market, and then I'm going to talk about the non-competitive case. And in, in our model, we use Cornwall competition okay, to, to model that. Uh, and then if I have time, I, have, I will go through the pass-through of CBDC, interest on CBDC itself, okay, and how that's affected by the uh, interest on reserves. Okay. Uh, and then I will do a little bit of policy coordination as well. Um, maybe there are more things we can we can do, but I'll show you one case where you have you have you, the more the two uh, two rates uh, are coordinating in a certain way. Okay. Okay. So the first pass through of interest on reserves. Um, so I will first. Um, uh, just to outline the case without a CBDC, and then and then show how the CBDC is going to affect things. Okay, uh, so first we will talk about the competitive banking. Um, so uh, for the banks, the problem is kind of a simple there. So uh, basically, yeah, they invest on loans, so that's I L L part, and they also invest on reserves. Is that's Z? Okay, I use I use I R to denote the interest, and the minus that's a liability side. Um, so the D is deposit, and you pay I uh, I D for that. Okay, so that that's basically the bank's profit. Okay, and the two constraint. The first one is just a balance sheet liability. Sorry, sorry balance sheet identity, <laughs> and the second one is just a reserve requirement. Okay, so the chi a parameter. So that's a reserve reserve ratio. Okay. So and uh, so yeah, we solve the bank's problem, and we can combine that with household demand for deposits, and also the uh, uh, entrepreneurs' uh, demand for loans, and then we can sort of basically solve the equilibrium. Okay, I'll show you what the equilibrium looks like. Okay, um, so for the pass through, I'm going to show you, as I said, just the four things. Okay, uh, the first column, uh, the, the first column, that's the. Uh, uh, okay, the first column that's the rates. I'm looking. I have an iPad here. <laughs> Uh, so the first column, there are the rates, and the the top figure that's deposit, and then the uh, the and, and the lower uh, panel that's for loans, okay. And the uh, the second column, the, there are the quantities, okay. Uh, actually, uh, most of the time you can you can just focus on the first column because the second column, uh, basically that's going to be pinned down by the household demand for for deposit and and the the, uh, the entrepreneurs uh, demand for loans, basically. You have the first column, you are going to get the second column. Okay, so most of the time, I think, without loss of generality, we can just focus on the first column. Okay, uh, and the, on the vertical axis, I have the uh, interest on, uh, on reserves. Okay, so when I talk about the pass through, I mean how uh, the uh, deposit rate and quantity, and of course, the also loans, uh, uh, they, they are they are going to respond to uh, to changes in the interest on reserves. Okay, that's what I mean uh, by definition of a pass through. Okay, so. So without the CBDC, okay, it's going to have we're going to have like a two 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 cases or two regimes there, okay. So depending on what the uh, what the interest on reserves uh, is, okay. For low interest, for low interest on reserves, okay, uh, then then balance sorry, not, then the reserve requirement is going to bind. So remember, uh, the, the the bank can make profits by making loans, uh, but if the uh, reserve uh, rate, as we call interest on reserves or reserve rate, the same thing uh, from from my from my uh, from my uh, from my wording. Uh, so if the reserve rate is too low, okay. Uh, then, sort of basically holding the holding reserve is kind of a cost right, that the bank has to bear to to issue loans. Okay, uh, and so the reserve requirement is going to bind. And if we if we and then um, the reserve is the loans in some sense are that complements, right? To make loans, you have to hold you know, hold hold reserves. Okay, um, and then if we have higher IR IR, that's the interest on reserves. If that increases, okay, intuitively it's going to decrease the cost of issuing loans. Okay. Um, 
so uh, in, in another sense, case so and then we have a competitive banking, right? So facing a lower cost of issuing loans, uh, the the bank is going to pass on that benefit to to entrepreneurs as a lower loan rate. So that's why uh, that's why if you look at lower lower panel for the rate, the, the, the first column, okay, it is decreasing, okay. Um, and for loans, they are the flip side, basically. Okay, so if they get loan rate is uh, is lower than the loans, uh, they, are, they are going to issue more loans. Okay, and okay, so once they once the interest goes so once the uh, once the interest is higher, okay, at the high high IR, then uh, at some point the 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 reserve requirement is is going to become loose. Okay, and in that case, uh, reserves and the loans are going to become substitutes. Okay, and then the uh, basically these two forms of assets are going to earn the same return. Okay, so if the loan rate, so if the reserve rate is higher, then the bank is going to move some funds from loans to reserves. Okay, and so the loan rate is going to be higher. For deposit side, okay, the depositor is going to benefit because uh, the, basically the bank has a higher return on their asset side. Okay, so in e either way, uh, the the bank is going to pass on the benefit to to the depositor as um, as higher deposit rate. Okay, so deposit are going to increase. So that's that's without the CBDC. Okay, so with CBDC, what is going to happen is. Um, uh, is that, so as I said, so CBDC is going to affect the economy like through through two, uh, two things. We can assume uh, uh, it can. Uh, we assume that CBDC is a perfect substitute um, uh, for bank deposits as as a payment instrument. So basically, uh, the CBD, so CBDC rate is going to form a, a lower bound okay, on the deposit rate. Okay. And at the same time, uh, the banks can hold CBDC as a form of asset. Okay, so uh, and and then uh, basically the bank is going to uh, the, the, the they can hold central uh, central bank liabilities as as assets. So the effective rate for that is going to be basically the max of IE and IR. Okay, now okay, if IE is higher, then the the, the bank will be more willing to hold uh, CBDC as reserves um, uh, instead of. Uh, Reserves. Okay, so there are three ways CBDC can affect the economy. Just uh, asking the question whether it's going is attractive, it's attractive for the for the banks, is it attractive for the for the depositors? Okay. Okay, so introduce the CBDC. So basically, this figure the blue the blue lines are same as before, and then the 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 the, uh, the red red figure red lines so they are they are where it's into, uh, CBDC is introduced. Okay, so. Uh, so, in, with competitive banking, introducing CBDC is sort of a kind of pretty straightforward uh, analysis. Okay, so basically, uh, one one thing we can first conclude is that with competitive banking, okay, uh, then CBDC is not, not going to be attractive as means of payment for depositors. Why? Um, because, as I said, so I mean, for the bank, um, they are I mean, they, they they have access to the central bank liabilities, right? And then the 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 uh, return for that is 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 I, IER, uh, right? So that's at least the CBDC rate. So for the depositors, what do you want to? If the, the bank is already offering pretty good, good return, so you don't want to hold uh, CBDC, right? Um, and so basically, the effect is only zero. Um, basically, the, the bank's asset portfolio decision. Okay, so if CBDC has a high return, then the bank is going to hold CBDC as a form of central bank liability instead of reserves. Okay, so that's why. So for lower for lower uh, IOR uh, interest on reserves, we're going to have the flat parts. So basically, uh, yeah, basically yeah, banks hold, hold hold CBDC instead of uh, uh, in reserves. So that's why. Um, yeah, CBDC here like mute the um, pass through of of interest on reserves, kind of a kind of straightforward way. Okay. Okay, and then and I move on to uh, Corna. Um, so uh, the Corna is is it basically the, the bank solve the same problem? Is the only things now look at the uh, sort of the red thing in the in the brackets so that so that DJ is bank J's uh, deposit. Okay, so bank has market power. So DJ is going to affect the uh, the market uh, deposit rate. Okay, so the bank is going to con consider that, and and that's the, that's the only thing that that, that changes basically compared compared with the uh, um, uh, competitive case. Okay, and so I'm going to yes. Um, 
I think for for some results we we can we can we can give some uh, quality uh, quality results, right? Um, but I mean, we cannot solve for them as explicit. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, yeah, say okay the deposit is going to be a certain form. We, we cannot do that. But for, yeah, for a lot of results we can at least qualitatively we can show some comparative statics. Okay, so uh, so f again, so look at the uh, so the, the the blue figure that's without CBDC and the the, the dashed red lines and they are with CBDC and without CBDC, it's very similar to the component banking case. Quality, of course, uh, quantitatively is is very different because the, mark, uh, the, the banks have market power, right? So uh, so they will still pass on um, if there's a change of internal reserves, the bank is still going to pass on the effect of that to to depositors and entrepreneurs. But the uh, magnitude is much smaller because they have market power, right? Um, and if we introduce CBDC, things are kind of a uh, quite a, quite different now. So now. Uh, so now, because they, without the CBDC, the bank, if they have a lot of market power, they may offer very low deposit rate. Okay, so now with CBDC, actually, if you introduce a CBDC, even not with a moderate CBDC rate, it may it may become appealing to the depositors as a means of payment. Right, so that's that's a new 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 force that that you are going to have uh, if we have. Uh, Okay, that's good. If we have the uh, we have the um, market power on the deposit market, okay. So, um, so as you can see there, so for low interest on on reserves, okay, the bank tends to also offer, of course, a low deposit rate, okay. Um, so in that in that case, if we introduce CBDC, okay. Um, and then depositors are going to find it very appealing, right? So the banks are going to match match the CBDC rate, okay? So so that's why you see the flat part, the, f the first uh, uh, the, the graph, that's the deposit rate, okay? It's going to be uh, the height of that red line, so that's basically the CBDC rate, okay? Uh, so CBDC is going to uh, determine the deposit rate, and if at the same time, if the reserve uh, requirement uh, also also tight, uh, then the CBDC is going to basically the the rate of CBDC is going to dictate the whole economy. Okay? So long side, uh, long side as well. Okay, so that's the that's the flat part of every curve. Okay, and then you also see uh, for the deposit uh, cur uh, curves, they are flatter, longer than the uh, than the low curves. Okay, uh, that's okay. Then you have the change of the so that that uh, increasing. A red dashed line in the in a long in a long read curve. Okay, uh, that's where the reserve requirement becomes loose. Okay, if if that's the case, then basically we have a kind of a little bit of dichotomy. Uh, CBDC rate dictates the deposit side, and then uh, the uh, reserve uh, rate is going to determine the long side. Okay, so that's the that's that part. And of course, when CBDC sorry, when when interest on reserves is very high. Um, even with um, uh, market power, okay, the bank is offering a pretty appealing uh, deposit rate, uh, then CBDC is not going to be used anymore. So that's why the blue and red, they join each other. Okay. So, yeah, with uh, that, I can uh, do a very quick uh, summary of the effect of CBDC on pass-through. Uh, so, so without the CBDC, uh, the pass-through of the interest on reserve depend on whether the Reserve requirement is binding or not, okay, and and also the deposit market structure, okay. So and we can have full pass through to long rate when the reserve requirement is loose. Okay, the bank is just equal, uh, basically equating the long rate return and the uh, uh, interest on reserves, and we can also have a pa full pass through, okay, if uh, plus that we also have competent banking, okay. Um, however, if uh, we have either uh, that the, the, the banking sector is not competitive or the reserve, re reserve requirement is binding, then we tend to have some weak pass through okay, of the interest on reserves. Okay? And then if we introduce CBDC, our general picture is that CBDC is going to weaken the pass through of interest on reserves. Okay? And the effect depends on the deposit market structure. So as I mentioned, um, that's fine, I think. With a competitive case, CBDC can mute the pass through of interest on reserves. Um, uh, th that's just because of the sort of asset allocation uh, effect, okay? And if we have a core law, like or non-competitive uh, deposit market, and then uh, then the, the the weakening is because the depositor find CBDC a, 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 an appealing um, payment method, okay? So in that case, then if the 
reserve requirement binds, then basically CBDC is going to dictate everything, right? It's like completely like a milling. Um, and if R is loose, then uh, the, the interest on reserves can still affect the uh, can, can still affect the, the long side. Okay. So I think my time is sort of up. As I said, so this probably is the most important part of the, of the paper. And for the completeness, we also talk about the uh, pass through of interest on, sorry, the interest on CBDC. But as I said, so policymakers are not going to consider that as a very like, active policy choice, at least not, not at the very beginning. But uh, it was useful to know uh, what to expect. So that's why we have that section. Okay, so I will go very quickly just uh, there. Now, conclusion, right? So basically, we're saying that this the so CBDC interest on CBDC and and, and the interest on, uh, on on reserves they tend to be in each other's way somehow, right? So so if we really have a CBDC into the economy uh, as a policymaker, we'll have to consider we'll have, have to consider how how they are going to affect each other. So when we do the monetary policy, so that's the sort of main message, okay? And we may need some coordination between that too. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. Before opening the uh, floor to question, I would like to uh, ask Marianne to come in on the floor for her discussion of this paper. Thank you. Shall I see my, uh, wait, my, for my slides? Or, yeah. <laughs> slides are coming. Good. Great. So thank you very much for, uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, so I can, ah, I have to, <laughs> with this, sorry. <gasps> Okay, so there's now a growing literature on CBDC, but uh, there's not, not that many papers actually trying to study precisely the path through of monetary policy and how that will be affected uh, by CBDC. So this paper contributes to that. Um, I think by now the debate on whether uh, CBDC is desirable or not is not totally conclusive. There's still a lot of discussion. People are not totally convinced. Um, and I think one view uh, in this debate is whether, you know, the fact that if we are going to do this CBDC, if we are going to issue CBDC, then maybe we have to do it in such a way that it's a game changer, that re really changes things, or it's better uh, to refrain from that. That was the view that was uh, exposed, uh, for example, last week in, at the Riggs Bank in a conference. Uh, so I think that the pass-through dimension that this paper studies is a key dimension on that, because uh, if you know the pass-through of monetary policy becomes more effective for monetary policy, this could be a dimension that provides incentives to central banks to uh, go, go, go with that and, and do it in such a way that uh, it is a game changer. Uh, this paper precisely shows that uh, CBDC can be a very powerful tool for the central bank in terms of a pass-through of monetary policy. So very quickly, the setting is, is uh, I mean, the main ingredients. Uh, the authors consider perfect competition in the loan market, imperfect or perfect competition in the deposit market, and CBDC is a perfect substitute to deposits. Uh, and then the uh, central bank, which is a consolidated uh, authority, actually, is going to have uh, as policy instruments the reserve requirements, the interest on reserves, and the interest on CBDC. So I'm not going to go through the, all the cases because Janet explained that uh, pretty in detail. Uh, just let me tell you that uh, if you consider competitive deposit market or Kurno deposit market, uh, essentially the fact of introducing CBDC is going to have an effect. In, I mean, it's going to may render the interest on the on reserves uh, a bit useless uh, actually because it can be that uh, doesn't uh, have the effect if the interest rate on CBDC is high enough, uh, which are the, the red cases, I put in red. Um, so can also happen that um, 
In particular, if uh, the interest rate on reserves is very low, the path through uh, of the interest on reserves is totally muted, or even for intermediate cases uh, of the level of the interest on reserves, it can happen that the interest on reserves have, has an effect on the loan rate at the retail level, but uh, the deposit rate is totally determined by uh, the interest on CBDC, which is you know, the, right, the, the perfect substitute for, for deposits. So overall, the CBDC is going to tend to weaken the path through that uh, the central bank can have via uh, the interest on reserves. And if you consider uh, how the interest on CBDC uh, is going to affect the economy, well, uh, overall, I would say, uh, to, 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 for the sake of time, that uh, the authors show that uh, the interest on CBDC is pretty powerful, in particular for determining the deposit rate at the retail uh, level. So my comments. Um, so first of all, I, I, I think that uh, something I would have liked to uh, see more discussed in the paper is the effect on the loan rates. I mean, the authors have a very stylized and elegant model, and somehow I feel bad that maybe my comments go in the sense of uh, making this model less uh, stylized, and this is not nice, I, 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 I agree. But uh, actually what I think is that uh, when we think of CBDC, you typically think that more or less you can see how uh, the interest on, risk on CBDC is going to affect the uh, interest on deposits because then it's a perfect substitute and deposits have like an outside option that is totally given by this CBDC. What is less clear is how CBDC is going to affect the loan rates for me. And so the authors study the deposit market in more detail in the sense that they consider a deposit, uh, sorry, competitive market, a Kurno market, whereas the loan part uh, is actually uh, considered as competitive um, setting. But for me, you know, it's, it's like, it would be more interesting to study this imperfect competition in the low market, uh, because then you know, we, need, we want to know how the central bank can affect these rates, given that uh, there's no this outside option channel that we have for the deposit rate. Uh, so here, you know, they have some insight, for example, the fact that the uh, conditions on the loan market are going to be uh, dependent on the level of the reserve rate. There are several results, but I think it will be interesting to explore imperfect competition. There's papers that have done that, for example, Heather All, uh, and they show plenty of evidence that this market is, is not competitive, but they don't have CBDC. Um, there's another dimension which is, is not in the paper, uh, which is about the speed. Uh, I think that CBDC could actually um, affect the time that uh, a change in the policy rate takes to affect retail rates. There's, there's this dimension of time, right? Uh, you know, using CBDC could speed up the process. Uh, this is, of course, not present in the paper because it's stationary equilibrium, adjustments are totally costless, perfect, uh, and so on. But, you know, we have evidence that uh, the path through is pretty slow. Uh, for example, there's a paper by Messner and Nipman, a short paper that shows that uh, there's a significant proportion of uh, path through that occurs pretty quickly. But then still when you look at one year, uh, for example, path through is still uh, incomplete and rates of path through for overnight deposits are below 50 percent even uh, after one year they look at uh, ecb data uh, for uh, 20 years uh, so i think uh, that's another uh, another interesting uh, dimension that could be uh, explored i don't know how to do that in the model but i think it's something something that could be very very interesting uh, so they also show these authors that uh, the path through is different for uh, deposits held by the by firms or by households. So it's related to the, 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 the fact that bargaining power could not be the same for these agents. Uh, the, in, the, that's not what we have in the paper, but the paper stresses the bargaining power as, as, as an important, I mean, the imperfect competition as an important uh, part of the path through process. I have a, you know, some questions about the reserve requirements, the role that these, they play in the paper. Well, first of all, there's no motive, explicit motive for reserve requirements in the paper, which uh, may be okay. But I was wondering, maybe you can uh, provide in the paper some examples what happens if the uh, reserve requirements increase, decrease with the pass through, because we would like to, you know, see the interaction with CBDC of reserve requirements. And actually, you know, this CBDC, we're going to have some papers, may affect financial stability. That's part of the discussion. So there's no reason to think that if we introduce CBDC, reserve requirements are going to have to be the same as they are now. Maybe they have to be higher if we think that financial stability may be more of a concern or lower if we think the opposite. I don't know. But I think that it would be nice to, to, to see this interaction. 
actually. Um, so also, what if loans are risky? Also, I was thinking whether you can uh, differentiate remuneration of excess reserves and required reserves, which could also be a dimension uh, that affects the path through. Uh, and then I have a couple of questions. For example, what is the role of time deposit in your uh, paper, which I see in the environment, but then uh, didn't see in the analysis, but no, a detail. I was wondering, uh, well, you don't have an interval market by now in the in the paper, which is nice in the sense that you have this very stylized uh, model, and there's other papers that, that are doing that. But I was wondering, I mean, this can also affect the pass-through. If you think that the interest on reserves are going to affect the rate in the interim market, and through this, they are going to affect the uh, rates in the at the retail level, I was wondering whether you could think or at least discuss this a bit uh, in your paper, uh, because then the path through would depend on the institutional details of the market, right? For example, there's a paper by Afonso and Lagos that showed that for given policy rates, the Fed funds rate uh, depends on the relative uh, bargaining powers of borrowers and lenders and this type of uh, aspects. Also, I think that would be um, nice to uh, study the relative effectiveness of the interest on reserves and interest on CBDC. Uh, that would depend on the functioning of the internal market, actually, I think, in the policy discussion. So that's something uh, that would be interesting to see as well. Another point is the, about the fiscal cost of CBDC. So in your paper, you have a, a fixed uh, inflation target. Uh, but suppose that you have no taxation power, as you have now uh, in the paper. Uh, I mean, Fabio Panetta was uh, discussing before the role of senior age and whether if you wish to see CBDC would be in order to have, I mean, to, that the central bank profits from senior age. Uh, so the idea, I think, is to have positive profits and not negative profits. So I was wondering uh, if you have this constraint or how much the central bank can pay on reserves, can pay on CBDC, how this may affect uh, your analysis. Uh, I think that would be interesting to incorporate uh, to your model, and I'm very quick now. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, so I, I think this is a very interesting paper uh, that uh, you know proposes a different angle on CBDC and, and at the same time has some continuity with the previous work uh, because it seems, seems to be the case that CBDC is more effective or more useful when um, there's low but, um, competition in the uh, banking sector. Uh, a side comment, uh, I think that it would be nice to have graphs that compare the competitive and Curno, you know, so that we can see the level of the rate, retail rates in the same uh, graph. I think that will help uh, understanding. Uh, so very elegant model, and there's a lot of questions that I, I thought uh, about uh, that I think will be interesting to explore. Thank, thank you very much. Very much. Thank you a lot for this uh, discussion. Um, before um, Maybe before answering, we can collect a couple of questions uh, from the audience online or in presence. Uh, we have one from Livio and one from uh, the other gentleman over there. Okay, thank you. I'm Giuseppe Ferrero from Bank of Italy. So it is very elegant and very nice, the model. And let me start by saying, unfortunately, it focuses a lot on reserve requirement as a binding constraint. While we know the central bank, at least in advanced country, never use the reserve requirement as a, as a constraint. They provide reserves fully elastically to, to satisfy the reserve requirement of banks. So my question, so in a sense, I will buy the part where it is never binding the constraint. But maybe a, another way of, of introducing some constraint is about thinking more about regulation. So maybe LCR or other type of constraint. My suggestion is really do not use the reserve requirement because it, it is never binding in a sense. We can collect also the question from Livio. Thank you. So, leave us track ACB. So, um, I, I have a question which is not really on the model, but more more generally. So, as far as I remember, the um, Andolfato paper. So, basically, the 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 increased competition for for deposit is good. So, the fact that that um, you know is, is is welfare enhancing in a sense. No? But I've seen now, you know, several papers arguing that actually, you know, banks having a deposit franchise. Is actually stabilizing. So, uh, so for example, there, there's been a couple of papers saying essentially that the fact that banks uh, have some uh, rent uh, and deposit, so they pay deposits much below, in particular when interest rates go up. 
uh, is a stabilizing force. So I was wondering, so, so these papers kind of challenge the view that, you know, the more competition is better because basically, so the banks, so the banks have more franchise value. And so they are better able to perform their role, even when interest rates go up. Um, so I was wondering whether it's kind of your model, your results kind of speak to this question. So whether, you know, the welfare effects of having more or less, because this of course has an impact on the welfare effects of CBDC as well. So. So that, 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 that was my question, thank you. Well, first, uh, thanks, Mariana, uh, a lot for the, for the, for the thoughtful uh, discussion. And uh, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I agree uh, on all, all of that. So there are some, uh, some extensions we can, we can talk about. And uh, yes, with a little bit of sacrifice of, uh, of, of elegance, um, but it's all of the things I think are okay, worth, uh, worth exploring. I, I sort of like the idea of the, the time and dimension of mantra policy pass through. Maybe we can do a paper together. I know how. <laughs> Afterwards, we'll, they said the, the conference is a good, good, good place to to get a new new projects going. So that one have, we haven't thought about it before, and I think it's, it's very nice. So uh, yeah, I mean, in this paper we're sort of, uh, sort of emphasizing the uh, market structure for the deposit market, right? So, but the interbank market, for example, itself can also be be important in terms of monetary policy pass through. How that is going to uh, sort of combine with uh, CBDC? I think we're going to see a little bit of. I think I'm going to say a little bit, maybe tomorrow's one paper probably will talk about that a little bit, uh, the interbank market more, more explicitly um, uh, modeled. Uh, so I, I look forward to that too. Um, and uh, yeah, other yeah other ones we so yeah loan side it's it's, it's true. So you, um, we want to sort of uh, focus on the deposit side, and then the the reason why we did that is because we think CBDC is a it's a retail uh, retail payment instrument, right? So it competes very directly with the bank deposits. So as as a means of payment, so that's why we think the effect will be uh, coming very strongly from the uh, deposit side. Uh, for the loan side, at least we did it in our uh, the other paper, the the earlier paper. So we didn't do the competition. I think in, as Alan has paper did. So we 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 can we kept using Corona in the in the on the loan market. So a lot of the a lot of the results still go through, but of course they quantitatively is going to make some difference for sure, right? So how um, yeah, I me mean, uh, so the uh, probably the, uh, the 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 I mean, the qualitatively uh, probably it's going to be very similar in terms of how CBD is going to affecting is going to affect uh, pass through. Um, yeah, but uh, for very serious quantitative work, that that probably should be should be taken into consideration. Yeah. Um, about the reserve requirement, Mariana uh, talked mentioned that, and some also mentioned that. So, uh, so in that's right. We we could we could explain even more in the paper. So what uh, what do we mean by by that? I guess we uh, as that our thing is that we're not taking that very literally. So uh, I guess a lot of a uh, lot of us uh, countries they do not have. Uh, uh, like a reserve requirement, for example, Bank of Canada, uh, sorry, in, in Canada, we do not have the, the I mean, uh, the, the, the reserve requirement explicitly, it's, it's zero, right? So the banks do not have to uh, do reserves. But if you look at, uh, but the thing is that that's not some paper, uh, you do not have to uh, take any, uh, uh, you don't have to have any reserves. But the fact that the banks are holding a lot of uh, reserves on their balance sheet, okay, that means that it's still probably scarce, and and it's so it's it could be other other reasons. So it could not it may not be imposed by by the central bank for regulation purpose, but they could be using reserves for for other purposes. And in I think in in, in reality, they still I, I I think it's still kind of. Scares in, in in that sense, okay. Um, but yes, I, I I agree that we can we we, we should uh, we can explain a bit more. But uh, yeah, maybe I mean, for us it doesn't matter whether it's a reserve requirement or LCR. I think they work in the same way, right? So, uh, but uh, yeah, well, some explanation of that would be useful. Um, for welfare, um, welfare. Uh, so so the this paper for now we we do not look at the welfare this. The time being, it's a kind of a pretty uh, like, like kind of a factual uh, 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 exploration. So uh, for CBDC, the welfare implications are 
quite a complicated, I guess, it depending on what, what, I mean, there are many factors that you can, you can think about. So, uh, uh, so increase, for example, if, if CB, CBDC um, increases the competitiveness of the, of the deposit market, it could be welfare improving in a sense that it sort of, uh, uh, sort of, sort of counteracts the market power by the banks, right? So in that sense, it could be welfare improving, but it also depends on a lot of other things, right? So, uh, uh, for, 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 for example, uh, there could be, there you could be, maybe the banks are providing too much intermediation. That could be also possible, depending on the sort of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, so other factors in, in the economy. So, uh, now in that sense, if you, you crowd out, it's a good thing. It could be a crowding out, it could be even a good thing. So, for welfare implications are, I would, I would say you have to be very, very, um, very careful about the overall welfare effect. Um, but what we can do in our own papers would be at least within the context of this paper, like what are the impl uh, implications for welfare? And that's something we can we can talk about. But like if we want to see something about like you know the overall effect of CBDC, that's not, that's just a, 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 in my view, it's like a very complicated matter. I'm not so sure whether we can actually do that at all. Uh, it could be you are achieving uh, an, a good a policy objective on one dimension, but you are sort of hurting another dimension. And then if you have this competing um, effects, then which one is more per, like more dominant, that can be a judgment by the policymaker, right? I, I was saying, okay, this question is more more serious, so that's why I put more weight on that. So that, that but then also involves a lot of judgment from the from the, the, the decision makers too. Um, but uh, yes, I, I agree that with that too. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet, and thank you to the audience. Um, I fear we are short of time. Uh, we have to move on to the to the next paper now uh, by Benjamin Hemingway from Bank of England on the impact of central bank digital currency on bank deposit and the intermark market. Uh, Benjamin, you have the floor. Thank you. While I wait for my slides to appear, this is work I did while I was uh, at the Bank of Lithuania. So the usual disclaimer applies twice for both my current and previous institution. So <clears throat> again, in terms of motivation, hopefully we don't need uh, too much motivation in this room for why we want to look at uh, CBDCs. So instead, I'll focus more on, on what I do. So I focus on the effect of CBDC on the market for uh, retail deposits. So I abstract a lot from uh, some of the other uh, more complicated parts of the CBDC debate. Um, but I focus on the impact of CBDC on bank settlement through standing facilities in the interbank market. So there'll be more papers on the interbank market uh, tomorrow. But, you know, for me, uh, this is kind of one of the key channels. And I, the research questions I had in mind when I uh, started this paper uh, was what happens to the market uh, for retail deposits, so this goes back to kind of Janet's paper where there's this market structure uh, component um, of CBDC. The second is, uh, can the CBDC remuneration rate be an effective monetary policy tool? So this was, you know, talked about a lot in kind of the early literature. It's kind of fallen to the wayside now. So I just had a little bit more evidence that that was a good decision uh, by policymakers to uh, uh, not focus on this. Uh, and the third uh, is, does CBDC affect transmission of the policy rate? So essentially, what I do in this paper, uh, I model CBDC as a closer substitute to bank deposits than money, right? So banks now face additional competition. Um, I assume that CBDC is exchangeable on demand for deposits, which means there's going to be additional settlements between uh, the banks and the central bank. And uh, the kind of key assumption I make is that the central bank isn't going to directly you know, uh, use the interbank market. Instead, these increased uh, settlements uh, are going to lead, uh, at least in the model, to increase use of the standing facilities. Um, and this is going to generate additional costs for the banks. So uh, the model features, I have this imperfect competition between a finite number of banks and a CBDC. Um, I delved into uh, my old I.O. textbooks, and I have this uh, Salab Circle model, which is uh, uh, essentially a spatial uh, competition model where there's product differentiation. So there's two dimensions of uh, competitions, if you like. There's price competition for deposits, so banks can alter the interest rate, but also there's uh, spatial differentiation. So um, 
when when I uh, think about the model with bank entry and exit, uh, the number of banks is going to determine essentially uh, the number of different varieties of, of uh, bank deposits, right? So one bank's uh, uh, current account isn't going to be a perfect substitute for another. Uh, and so, you know, there, there are some implications for that when, when you have banks uh, choosing to exit the deposit market. There's also going to be uh, liquidity shocks to deposits, which is going to be linked to um, uh, use of the interbank market and the central bank standing facilities. So there's, um, deposits are going to be a relatively attractive source of uh, liquidity for banks because it's cheaper than, um, um, say, kind of uh, the bond market in terms of um, financing their operations, but it comes with this liquidity risk um, and that liquidity risk is going to be increasing in the market share of CBDC, which uh, is going to generate a lot of uh, the action in the model. So the key results are that the introduction of CBDC increases competition of banks in the deposit market. Uh, banks are less profitable because they face this additional competition. They seek alternative source of funds, so they substitute away from bank deposits. Um, uh, also, when I allow for entry and exit, because banks are less profitable, you see uh, banks exit the deposit market, and uh, the deposit market becomes more concentrated, uh, at least in the banking uh, banking side. Um, I show that the CBDC remuneration rate is an inefficient monetary policy tool because there's this uh, imperfect pass-through of the CBDC remuneration rate to a deposit rate, and uh, increasing CBDC remun uh, remuneration uh, leads to uh, can lead to decreased bank deposit rates. So it's not always, you know, raising the CBDC remuneration rate is going to lead to higher deposit rates. And this acts through this uh, uh, increased uh, market concentration mechanism, right? If you raise the CBDC remuneration rate too much, banks substitute away from deposits. The, the remaining banks have more market power and um, they, in some situations they can actually lower the deposit rate. Um, finally, uh, there's also this channel through which CBDC can affect the transmission of monetary policy uh, in the model. Uh, so this is essentially how the policy rate um, passes through to the deposit rate. Um, and this is, uh, if you like, I, I make some assumptions later in the model where I kind of isolate the, the two effects, right? So I fix the spread uh, between uh, the policy rate and the CBDC rate, so they move together. And I show that, you know, there's uh, uh, the CBDC market share affects this pass-through of the policy rate to the deposit rate, and there are difference uh, when I allow for entry and exit in the banking sector. So there are uh, what I call long-run and short-run differences. Um, so there's a lot of uh, related literature now. Uh, we'll get to see a lot of the papers uh, today and tomorrow. Um, uh, I won't, uh, in the interest of time, uh, spend too much on the literature. I'm going to move to the model. So uh, the model is going to be uh, a two-period model. Um, there are going to be uh, three agents, depositors. They have heterogeneous preferences, which are going to be modeled uh, in this uh, uh, Salop circle setting, and they choose to deposit either at a bank, a specific bank, or uh, the central bank through CBDC. Um, banks are gonna compete for deposits. They do this uh, through um, price competition, so um, through the interest rate, and the central bank operates standing facilities and can decide whether or not to issue a CBDC, and if it uh, issues a CBDC, it can set the remuneration rate. In terms of the timing, so, um, in the first period, banks uh, raise liquidity. It's going to be an exogenous uh, amount of liquidity, and they can choose either to raise it from the central bank um, or you know, through some external uh, debt market, um, or they raise, it, uh, uh, they raise this liquidity through deposits. Um, and then once they've kind of set, if you like, their medium to long run funding uh, decisions, um, these deposits are hit by a liquidity shock, so banks have to return essentially to uh, this liquidity neutral position, and they do this either through the interbank market or 
uh, through the central bank's lending facilities. Okay, so um, depositors, uh, there's going to be unit you know, mass distributed around this sell up circle. I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit more uh, what's going on there, but essentially, um, you, you can think of this circle as representing the product space. Um, banks are going to locate uh, equally, uh, equally spaced around this circle, um, which is just, if you like, the, the optimal amount of product differentiation. You don't want to offer exactly the same uh, product as your competitors. Um, and um, you, depositors choose where to deposit uh, based on a deposit rate and a non-pecuniary uh, non cost, which depends. So the idea of this cost, which is you know, literally uh, in these spatial competition models, you, uh, the distance you are from the bank, you can think of this as capturing heterogeneous preferences and product differentiation. Okay? Um, and the idea is the banks are going to be very standard um, spatial competition in the sense that there's going to be linear transport costs uh, which are increasing in the distance from the bank. So depositors are going to choose between the two closest banks to their preferences, right? And then they're going to, um, they're going to weight the interest rate versus how much they like this product. And CBDC is going to be, um, if you like, a, a random transport cost that's independent of location. And you can think of this as capturing uh, how people maybe value privacy benefits that uh, Fabio was talking about in the keynote, right? And, um, and this is, um, yeah, and this is essentially the, the depositors' decision, right? They choose between, do they choose which bank? It's going to be, if they choose a bank, it's going to be one of the two closest ones, or they could choose CBDC, and it's, if you like, um, independent of their location. Um, banks, um, so I've covered most of this uh, already. Banks have to raise some exogenous liquidity amount, so I'm not thinking explicitly about modeling the, the loan market. Um, deposits are going to be subject to liquidity shocks, um, and these expected liquidity shocks are just going to be this uh, expected uh, cost C uh, term in the profit function. And the, the decisions bank have, uh, banks make in um, the first period is they choose their, uh, if you like, long-term funding BI, and they choose the interest rate RI that they set on deposits. Um, and I, I think of uh, two different cases. So in the short run, the number of banks is fixed at some finite number. And in the long run, uh, I allow N to adjust according to some free entry condition where you have, um, you know, the profits have to meet the, the kind of fixed cost F uh, of entry. So the central bank uh, is very simple. They set the policy rate, which is R subscript F. They also set the uh, standing facilities. Uh, the standing facilities are going to operate at you know, a penalty rate. You can think of this as, as the uh, corridor system, where uh, banks borrow liquidity through a lending facility, which is a higher rate than the policy rate. Um, and banks can also deposit liquidity through the deposit uh, facility, which has a lower um, lower interest rate than the policy rate. And they also set uh, the remuneration rate of CBDC, which is this uh, subscript CB in my model. And they obtain some market share. So QI is going to be the market share of deposits of, uh, of Bank I, and QCB is just going to be uh, what's left over uh, for the central bank. And that, that's going to be an important variable for, uh, for the model later on. So um, in terms of this liquidity shock, so once these long-term funding decisions have been made, this liquidity shock hits. Uh, so with some probability lambda, a fraction uh, psi of bank deposits re uh, depositors relocate around the circle. So what this means essentially is there's this uh, aggregate shift from bank deposits to CBDC. Um, I'm going to assume. Uh, for this presentation that lambda is not too large. In the paper, I also discuss the case where lambda uh, is large and you get um, uh, kind of a different decision uh, by the banks. But when the probability of this shock hitting is not too large, banks are ex ante liquidity neutral in the sense that um, 
you know, they don't want to hold excess liquidity in the case where uh, they're not hit by this outflow to CBDC. Okay, so essentially this epsilon is going to be uh, with the superscript zero is the excess liquidity, uh, or sorry, their liquidity deficit uh, when this outflow doesn't hit, and it's going to be equal to zero. And then with probability lambda, uh, each bank has a net liquidity outflow because there's this flow from uh, the banking sector essentially to CBDC. Okay, and all banks are going to have uh, uh, a liquidity deficit, and this is going to be increasing in the market share of CBDC, right? So this key CB is the market share of CBDC, and um, yeah, essentially, the idea is that you know everyone on the circle has some kind of probability of moving to a random location, and that's uniform. So everyone gets um, uh, so the inflow, so the outflows are spread over the entire uh, market, but because no no one um, flows out of CBDC in this in this case, um, you get the banking sector having uh, liquidity outflows that are increasing in the market share of CBDC. Okay. Um, in terms of the interbank market, so um, it's relatively straight, uh, relatively simple. Uh, the central bank sets the ceiling and the floor through these standing facility rates. Um, in the case where there's no liquidity shock, uh, the interbank market is going to lie uh, within the corridor because the aggregate liquidity of the banking sector is going to be zero, right, from the previous slide. Um, when this liquidity shock hits, because there's this outflow of liquidity, um, the ceiling is going to buy. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all bank. I'm sorry. Uh, so, sorry, I, I need to intervene. Uh, if you can have the question at the end, because otherwise the people in the audience they cannot uh, hear you from 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 from, from online. Um, sure. So the idea is every, every bank is so the law of large numbers essentially holds. So uh, every bank is hit by the same. Uh, will have the same fraction of their deposits flowing outwards, right? Um, the only, so essentially you can think of the first case as this shock ha hits, but it also hits the central bank, right? So then you have this, everyone essentially ends up with the same liquidity position. In the second case, this kind of, if you like, musical chairs uh, shock hits everyone except the CBDC depositors who stay still, and then you end up with a, all banks uh, receiving fewer inflows than outflows, right? But that, the size is going to be the same for all banks. Yeah, which is why in the second case, um, the ceiling binds because essentially there's going to be an aggregate uh, liquidity deficit in the banking sector. Okay. Uh, so the expected liquidity uh, cost of deposits um, is going to depend on the size of the shock, the probability of the shock, uh, the market share of CBDC, and also uh, in this case, the um, uh, the price of liquidity when the shock hits, which is going to be uh, the ceiling uh, interest rate, right? So this is going to essentially be one of the the channels through which um, CBDC affects uh, the cost of um, deposits for the banking sector. Um, so yeah, so if the market share of CBDC increases, the liquidity cost of deposits is also going to increase. So this is. Uh, the deposit market without CBDC, this is, you know, a, uh, a fraction of the circle, if you like, um, where uh, banks are going to compete in terms of the deposit rate, RI, obviously in equilibrium, all banks are going to charge a symmetric interest rate, but the marginal, there's going to be a marginal depositor, which is located in equilibrium between two banks, in this case, um, and they're, they're essentially going to be indifferent between depositing at bank I or I plus one. Um, this is kind of very standard uh, in the literature. This is what happens when I add uh, CBDC. So essentially on the, now we still have on the x-axis, if you like, competition between two banks. So the distance between the two banks is going to matter for uh, uh, which bank you prefer. But now we have this other dimension, which is the CBDC cost, which is independent of location. So essentially, now you can think of it as less of a circle and more of a ring. And you have, if you like, the, uh, 
the people who prefer CBDC and end up depositing in CBDC rather than a bank are going to be relatively far away from a bank, so they don't like bank deposits. Uh, there's no kind of current account that meets their needs, if you like, and they prefer CBDC, right? So these, if you like, uh, the privacy uh, concerned individuals uh, in Fabio's keynote, right? So th these are the people who um, who shift from banks to bank deposits, and obviously this is going to depend on the equilibrium deposit rate and the equilibrium uh, re remuneration rate of CBDC. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through uh, the first order conditions and all the maths, but what I will say is there are uh, kind of three important uh, points for the CBDC rate, which is if the CBDC rate is sufficiently low, uh, CBDC has no market share because people prefer banks, right? Um, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, unre unremunerated CBDC, right? If the preferences, if the demand in terms of preferences is very high for CBDC, this could be essentially a negative interest rate, right? Uh, so it all depends, if you like, a little bit on the preferences. Um, if um, then there are essentially two different uh, cutoffs, which is um, if uh, the CBDC limit, uh, if CBDC is sufficiently um, high, no banks enter in the long run because this profit condition uh, kind of binds, right? So this is, if you like, the so the second cutoff is below the last cutoff, which is then if the CBDC remuneration rate is really high, you get the point where uh, there's no entry of banks even in the short run, and that's due to um, these liquidity costs uh, all the way back here, right? So essentially, um, if the remuneration rate is sufficiently high, you get these uh, liquidity costs getting really high, and um, all banks essentially prefer outside um, non-deposit financing. Um, okay, so I have kind of simple graphs to kind of illustrate everything. Um, um, and these kind of show, show the effects, right? So this is when I get rid of the liquidity shock part and I just look at, um, if you like, the market structure part of the model. And I show that, you know, in the short run, which is where I, I fix the number of banks, um, I don't care if they're making the same amount of profit anymore, then when you increase the CBDC remuneration rate, which is the x-axis, then you get uh, an increase in the deposit rate, right? Which, which makes sense. This is kind of the standard uh, effect you would think. You would think banks face more competition. They have to raise, uh, raise deposit rates, right? But then even in the case without liquidity shocks, um, because, you know, in the long run, banks have to make the same amount of profits as they did before. The number of banks or you know, deposit-taking uh, institutions in the model will fall as the CBDC remuneration rate uh, falls, right? So uh, in the long run, you get this, um, yeah, and I should say that this is kind of, you can prove this analytically, I show in the paper, that in the short run, uh, the deposit rate is always going to be increasing in the CBDC rate. Right, but when you have the long run, uh, that's not the case. And you know, uh, luckily for me, this uh, uh, numerical uh, calibration um, kind of shows that in the long run, you get that the uh, market concentration effect dominates. So you have banks leaving the deposit market, and each remaining bank has more market power, uh, which allows them to set higher deposit rates, even when you increase uh, the CBDC remuneration rate, okay? So then what happens when you, when I add back in the liquidity shocks, then Lambda is positive, and essentially you get um, an even larger impact. And now in the short run, it's not always the case that uh, the CBDC remuneration rate is monotonically increasing, right? And that's because as you increase the CBD, the market share of CBDC, uh, this affects the liquidity cost of bank deposits. Now you get this nonlinear uh, U effect because uh, the cost of um, the expected liquidity cost depends not only on the market share of CBDC, but the market share of banks, right? So this is kind of why you get the uptick at the end because QI ends up being really small and 
uh, lowering this expected liquidity cost. Um, and then, you know, in the long run, this effect is even more dramatic. Um, in terms of monetary policy, so um, I make some assumptions, which is essentially uh, all exogenous interest rates, so that's the standing facility and the CBDC rate, are a fixed spread over the policy rate. So then I look at how, how does the deposit rate change when uh, the policy rate changes if you hold essentially the spread uh, fixed. So this is an, an so this is a very um, particular, if you like, neutral policy for the model, which is to say CBDC shouldn't be unremunerated. It should have uh, a fixed spread to the policy rate. Okay, it can be positive or negative, but this essentially um, is the neutral rate in the model. Um, and once you have that, um, you get the the model is very simple when there's no CBDC, which is um, uh, you get perfect pass through. There's there's not a lot of frictions uh, that I add without CBDC. But when you add CBDC and you have the liquidity shock uh, and you need both, then this uh, deposit rate pass through uh, is no longer equal to one. And the reason why is because this expected liquidity shock depends on uh, this ceiling rate, and the ceiling rate, I assume, is the policy rate plus the spread, right? So this is uh, this is how it works, and then this is what it looks like graphically. Um, and essentially, you need a relatively large, I would say, shock for this to matter quantitatively, right? So the so the the kind of theory, theory part of the paper says, you know, there's this uh, channel. Uh, liquidity cost channel, which uh, affects the pass through for the deposits rate. But if you look at the y axis on the left hand side, it doesn't really affect it very much, right? Uh, you get different rates in the short and the long run, but essentially, you know, once you increase the size of these shocks, then uh, it starts to matter more. So that's, um, that's kind of it probably for time. So, um, yeah, just to kind of summarize the policy implications. Um, CBDC is likely to increase the concentration of banks in the deposit market if you allow uh, for entry and exit in these models. Um, CBDC remuneration rate is an inefficient monetary policy tool, which is, you know, what I think central banks realized quite early on. And C there's also this mechanism through the standing facilities and the extra use of the standing facilities, uh, which can affect the transmission of monetary policy. Okay. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, before opening the floor to questions, uh, we have the discussion by uh, Timothy from the University of Liverpool. The floor is yours. Well, while I'm waiting, yeah, it's, just, it's great to be here. It's lovely to be uh, at the CBC conference in the home of the digital euro. It's, uh, it's a nice thing. So, yeah, thank you for all the organizers. Right. So, um, yeah, so thanks for a nice paper. Um, like, I've, there we go. I've played with uh, salad models before, and I think it's a really nice kind of arena to talk about market power. And actually, yeah, you use a lot of clever modeling tricks, which are very creative. So was, I learned a lot from that. So um, I guess I don't need to explain too much the, the mechanism because you did it pretty well already. But basically, there's this point that high CBD issuance implies a lot of central bank to bank interaction. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I don't think we necessarily thought about it enough. And certainly, so Benjamin makes the assumption that there is no extra um, liquidity provision by um, by the central bank, so they have to borrow through this expensive standing facility, and so that makes it um, lots of CBDC bank interaction makes it expensive for banks, and so we get this kind of uh, imperfect policy pass through where the CBC rate goes up, the share goes up, bank liquidity risk goes up, so they can't rate they're they're worried about uh, liquidity risk. They can't raise uh, deposits as much, deposit rates as much, so you get this imperfect pass through. So there's this kind of this mechanism by which using CBDC for monetary, uh, for monetary policy might not be the easiest thing. So yet another thing on our kind of laundry list of things to worry about for CBDC. So um, yeah, the one, the first thing that kind of it really uh, brought home for me was just this thinking about what would it actually look like on this microstructure of actually the central banks interacting with banks on a, on a much larger scale. And I think the, the thing that kind of struck me first was there's a lot of worry about that. And obviously, it's kind of kind of going back to the old days where banks and uh, central banks didn't do much of this. But if we're looking at today, that's not actually so unusual, right? This is kind of what we see. I mean, this is just the uh, overnight repos, but these are big numbers. And so already the central banks and uh, banks are interacting a lot already. So 
we can see here that CBDCs are kind of crystallizing this new normal. So I'm borrowing the pandemic phrase of new normal. But um, so while it is kind of maybe scary, it's not necessarily so scary because it's more like continuing what we're doing right now, which is to have lots and lots of uh, central bank, bank interaction. And I think you kind of stop short of making it in the paper, but it seems like the clear policy kind of point of this, uh, this paper is that if you're going to have increasing uh, central bank digital currencies, you also want to increase your central bank lending facilities. Make this, the, the whole point of this kind of this mechanism happens because the central bank lending facility is very expensive. So just offer more lending facilities if you're going to offer more uh, central bank digital currency. That, that seemed to be, I mean, I don't think you stopped short of making that, but that seems to me the kind of clear implication. Right, so that's kind of the, the paper. Let's go into my, uh, my criticisms, my comments. The first is you kind of focused on contractory monetary policy. So this kind of this this mechanism, as I put it there. But I think that expansionary monetary policy is probably the kind of where that's where we worry more about monetary policy pass through. Can we kind of cut rates and get everyone else to cut rates? Obviously, in the model, it's all symmetric. It's just a derivative. But is the argument really um, symmetric? Is it so that banks can't really pass on these lower rates? So while you make the argument kind of nicely in the paper going in one direction, in the other direction, if you're cutting rates, I don't see why that doesn't mean the banks can pass that. Um, the central, the banks can't pass that on, and so um, I mean the usual answer is deposit elasticity. You can't reduce deposit rates too much because you'll lose all your uh, market share, and so you, you've already got a model with market power. So if you kind of increase the amount of market power, reduce the number of banks, you could really um, exploit this a bit more. And I thought this is particularly interesting because one of the big things about CBDC is this possibility of negative rates, kind of really pushing it down into kind of negative territory. And that's something that you might be able to explore a bit more if you really kind of increase the, uh, the market power of banks. You kind of allow for these policy rates, so the pass through to go um, to negative. So and that's my kind of my first most kind of obvious comment. Um, second, I mean, this is a micro paper, so there's loads of assumptions, that's, that's fine. Some of them, I think, just need a bit more justification. So first, obviously, remuneration. I mean, we kind of mentioned at the beginning that the digital euro is probably not going to be remunerated. And certainly that's going to kill monetary policy. You can't really do much policy if you're not going to remunerate. Um, so at least just justify this or think about kind of which banks are thinking about remunerating CBDC, something like that. Secondly, is this so you have the CBDC and deposits are more, uh, more substitutable than money, but they're still not perfectly substitutable. Certainly, in my mind, when I'm thinking about CBDC, um, if you're going to have remuneration, they're probably going to be fairly substitutable. What's the really big difference between a central bank digital currency and deposit if it's remunerated, obviously? And so if they're not, if it's not perfect substitutability, fine. But why? What am I thinking about here? Is it, is it the accessibility option already? Uh, is it privacy? Is it smart contracts? What, what are we kind of thinking? Uh, secondly, is the short and long run. Obviously, super interesting theoretically. Um, but for monetary policy, only the short run is really applicable, like we're kind of thinking about the short run. And second, I thought of it as you were presenting, which is that bank exit is not costless. So it's costless in the model, but in reality, it is far from costless. So I think that that's something that we should at least kind of consider that bank exit is not a cost. It's not like any other firm in a seller model. You really kind of it's hard to it's hard, when banks fail, they do so noisily. Um, finally, yeah, you've got no asset side, which is again fine, but it really it means you're pushing all of the action onto the deposit rate. And so, obviously, if you had an asset side, you have some loan rate movement as well. Um, yeah, this one, I, I, fair enough, you kind of ceded to it in the end of your paper, which was that the the scale is pretty small here. So these are pretty kind of fourth digit changes. Even on the other one, it was single basis point changes. So as you said, it's going to be big shocks that's going to matter. I mean, how big shocks are we talking about? And then the other point I noticed was that this inflection point where the things get interesting, that's happening at very big shares of uh, central bank digital currency. So more than 50% of uh, CBDC. Now, do we really think the central bank is going to issue 50% of the, of the base? I mean, maybe, but I'd like to kind of, that needs to be um, justified. Uh, shameless promotion of my paper, we actually, we do a survey data and we find that only about 10% is, seems to be the amount the Germans have in mind. So. Certainly, if you're going to talk a lot about this inflection, at least justify how this is going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, maybe it's a low hanging fruit, but welfare, right? Like, kind of, is this is this significant? Like, kind of, what's what matters? I mean, in these sell up circle models, you can do loan surplus, bank profits. These are quite easy things for you to do, and you can calculate it, at least get a sense of kind of what matters. And similarly, optimal policy. I'd like to see some some kind of sense of policy. That that seems uh, seems reasonable. 
more difficult to answer, I think, is just this general micro versus macro. So, um, yeah, I am a macroeconomist, so obviously I'm going to be biased here. And I said, yeah, there's a Mark Twain criticism that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So obviously I'm going to think macro and all of these things. But certainly if we're thinking about effectiveness of monetary policy, it doesn't seem the most obvious to use a micro theory approach. I mean, you've got price changes, dynamics, general equilibrium. These things matter and we know they matter. And so I think that I love micro theory. Don't get me wrong. And I think that there are definitely places for it. But I think that the, in terms of um, pass through, maybe less so. And yeah, I kind of point out there's quite a lot of people that have already done things on this kind of approach, not with the pass through policy, but certainly, I mean, Woodford 2003, like way before it was CBDC, it was remunerated cash in his book. But he's already starting to think about this kind of possibility. And there are plenty of um, kind of examples. Again, I shamelessly cite myself. But um, this conference, there's lots of examples of lovely kind of macro papers. So they may be more appropriate for this particular topic. I think that's uh, it, it, it can be done. Um, and then finally, I just want to have a moment on just kind of what is it, the, what's the externality that we're really talking about here? What's the kind of thing that we're worrying about? So we have this kind of statement that cash use is falling. We know that. We know that kind of cash is falling. But why is that a bad thing? I mean, certainly kind of there are people who have talked about these things. But in this paper, what are we on about? Is it are we worried about relying on banks for payments, this kind of singleness of money, the central bank power? What is it that you're thinking of that's the thing that we're trying to kind of uh, go against? And I guess... I mean, in my mind, whenever I think about this, I think that banks have disintermediated the central bank, right? That's we're, we're very worried about the central bank disintermediating banks nowadays with CBDC, but banks have done that to central banks, right? We've reduced the amount of cash. That's effectively banks disintermediating the central bank. Why do we want to undo this? Like, what's the reason for this? Does it matter? And are banks today so much better off because of this disintermediation, because of this decline in cash use, this reliance on deposits? Are banks so much better off today? We're worrying about the inverse, but I kind of want to know, like, kind of, why are we worrying about this so much? What are the kind of, what are the things exactly that we're talking about? What are the externalities we want about? And that's the questions I want to see answered. And I think that some clarity on that would be useful. Fab. And then last slide. Yeah, there's just some missing literature. I mean, you've, you've probably added a whole load more from this, uh, from this conference. But certainly this, the point of just not in the, not in a CBDC context, but liquidity and monetary policy, old topic. So cite the big guns on that. There's a whole load of papers that you probably should cite. Lots of CBDC literature, lots of this conference as well, so it's really like them. And then one that I didn't see was PSAG Snyder, which was a bit surprising because that's a CBDC paper with banks as liquidity providers only. So I think that's something at least to compare with. Um, yeah, that's me done. But no, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. Thank you uh, for the discussion. Um, if there are questions in the audience, uh, one there. In the meantime, while the Microsoft travels down here, let me summarize uh, some of the questions we received from the online audience, uh, which were essentially all uh, referring to the uh, issue of the remuneration. Uh, most CBDC projects now are non-remunerated, so how um, the online attendants were wondering how the model will change without the remuneration uh, for CBDCs. Um, Catherine? Yeah, so Catherine Asma, ECB. So you are modeling the uh, non remunerated CBDC as a fixed spread to the policy rate, which I, I think so. So if I understood correctly. So this is, of course, right in the context of your model where you have a static model. But I think over the business cycle, you would think of a, a time varying spread of the CBDC rate to the policy rate because the policy rate is changed over time. So would you be able to look at that? Or do you have a feeling what your model would say on that? Are there other questions? Otherwise, we can oh, maybe this time have a sec. Oh, please, over there. Hello, uh, Tony Arnold, ECB. So the uh, just two comments. The result I liked uh, best from the paper is the difference between the short run and the uh, long run, where you could show that in, in the long run, you get this <clears throat> interesting and su uh, surprising result that higher CBC remuneration can actually reduce the deposit rate, so it might be worth uh, while uh, you know pushing this result more. And the other comment is I was and it's closely related to what the discussion said. I was a bit uncomfortable with your statement about you know efficiency or inefficiency when there was no welfare or normative analysis. So you may want to be a, a bit careful. Thanks. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, so yeah, thanks uh, to Timothy for the, the discussion. Uh, I'm definitely gonna uh, steal some of his ideas. Um, yeah, so 
Um, I guess uh, I'll start with the the remuneration part because uh, I got uh, uh, a lot of comments. So um, yeah, so on on Catherine's point, um, I I um, I didn't mean to say that the fixed policy rate is unremunerated rate, but that's the that's the policy neutral rate in the model, right? Is to have a, a fixed spread from uh, the policy rate to the CBDC rate um, and a non. Uh, unremunerated CBDC rate, I would have thought would, you know, you would just have a zero interest rate on that. Uh, but that would, as you say, have a time varying uh, spread. So this kind of links back to um, uh, some of Timothy's points, which is, um, I, I can look at, you know, uh, um, an unremunerated uh, CBDC rate and the pass through, because it would just be some combination of uh, you know the CBDC uh, um, pass through effect and the and the uh, policy rate pass through as as I've modeled it right um, because essentially you can think of part of it as uh, the effect that you get if you hold the spread fixed and then part is changing the spread uh, because you you want to hold the CBDC rate at zero so yeah I, I could do that uh, in the paper because you know I was focusing on the theory rather than the policy. Uh, to me, separating the two uh, made made kind of the uh, the mechanisms of the model a bit clearer. But yeah, I guess especially when I, I think about uh, the, the numerical part, it's easy to just fix the CBDC remuneration rate to zero and, and show that you know then you would get a bit more action because a lot of it would be uh, the unremunerate uh, the the CBDC remuneration part rather than just the. Uh, yeah, the uh, policy rate pass through. Um, yeah, on efficiency. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I wanted to to say anything about efficiency. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know why I did. I guess. Um, so, but in terms of welfare, obviously, uh, I'd, ret I'd refer you to Janet's uh, discussion about why modeling welfare is is difficult and we don't want to do it. Um, but also, in terms of a Salop Circle model, if you go back to your your uh, I/O textbook like I did, right, the standard Salop Circle model has too much entry when you allow for free entry and exit. So, you know, if I looked at welfare, I would bias the results very heavily in favor of CBDC, which maybe my boss would appreciate. But um, you know, basically kicking banks out of the uh, the deposit market is welfare improving in these models, right? So that's another thing that, that makes it bad. But also, I don't look at the fact that, you know, especially when you're holding the market structure fixed, having people switch from banks to CBDC means they prefer that, right? So at least from the consumer perspective, uh, you know, it's it's welfare uh, improving in the in the short run, at least, right? When the number of banks is fixed. Um, but yeah, I can do uh, maybe I can do a bit more uh, without talking about welfare, but you know, hinting at welfare, perhaps. Thanks. Um, if there are no more questions, yes. Sure. Oh, that's me. Okay, I thought you were looking at something else. Oh, uh, th thanks for the paper. Because uh, I think when we were doing our old paper, I think we were thinking about the setup model, and then it's good to see how that plays out. And one 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 comment. I guess I was a little bit confused uh, the, about the result that the why uh, CBDC is crowding out uh, sort of uh, uh, deposits. And I now I think I, I I know why. And it's related to one comment by by Tim as well. So the the model is kind of a kind of a partial equilibrium in the sense that the deposit I think probably is fixed. So if CBDC comes in and with the sell-up model, right, it's going to steal some business from from the, the from from deposits, right, for sure. Right. So that's like by almost by 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 assumption. So I guess what we had in our you know in our model or uh, 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 sort of the, the GP one. Uh, so that one we, we got the um, uh, CBDC can expand the deposit. And the reason for that is because we we can have kind of a little, you, you can suck something from the economy into deposits. I think that's a general equilibrium effect probably. So yeah, as a macro economist, I guess for at least in our paper, I think that's the sort of main reason why you could have a CBDC can crowd in, right? Because that's sort of shut down in, in, in your model. So I just want to sort of clarify that. Um, maybe it's useful, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. So, yeah, in, in the model, the the deposit markets are fixed size, and I I haven't looked at uh, endogenous changes in in uh, deposit market. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, there is maybe one last question from the audience, um, given that we are decently good on time. Yeah, thank, thanks for the presentations. I picked up on one of the points of the discussion on um, kind of that this this uh, cost of central bank lending is a kind of a key assumption that drives, I think, a lot of your results. And I was thinking about the optimal policy here, which is also a point that he made. So I wonder more specifically if you maybe even could characterize some kind of equivalence result that then would depend on what rate or what the cost is that the central bank uh, would charge on this lending facility. Uh, and if that's something that in these type of models is possible at all. And then I would be interested in what you think it would depend on. Um, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so it's definitely something I could look at more because um, in, in, the, in the paper I've just essentially uh, thought about a fixed spread. I haven't thought about, you know, altering the, the window rates or anything like that uh, or the window size. Um, one thing I would say is, you know, for me, this is a little bit maybe uh, a reduced form way of, of uh, modeling other costs that, that uh, the banking sector may face, right? So one is obviously, uh, you know, to the extent that banks need to provide collateral to the central bank in order to access some of these facilities, then, you know, I, I haven't modeled that, but that would be uh, increased use of these uh, standing facilities or, or other uh, central bank borrowing may raise these kind of like collateral uh, premium as well. Uh, so that's linking back a little bit to what it may depend on.